Hello, my name is Brian Atkinson and welcome to UK Aircraft Explored. In this video we shall cover the Arrow Lancaster's cockpit area. We will look at parts of the main fuel and engine systems and their instrumentation and controls within the cockpit. We shall be referring to the wartime 1943 Air Ministry manuals that were used by both air and ground crews at the time. I hope you find this interesting. The pilot controls four master engine cocks. On Lancaster 1 aircraft, the master engine cocks also control the slow running cutouts. The flight engineer controls two tank selector cocks, which select number one or number two tank on each side. A crossfeed cock, marked balance cock, connects the port and starboard supply systems and is on the floor just forward of the front spar with the handle visible through a hole in the spar cover. On Lancaster's 1 and 3, the fuel contents gauge switch, located on the flight engineer's panel, must be set on before the fuel contents gauges will give an indication. On Lancaster 10 aircraft, there is no fuel content gauge switch. The gauges will indicate whenever electrical power is available. Fuel pressure warning lights show when the fuel pressure at the carburetor falls below £6 per square inch on Lancaster 1 aircraft and £10 per square inch on Lancaster 3 aircraft. They are switched off by the fuel contents gauges switch and this switch must therefore always be on in flight. On Lancaster 10 aircraft, fuel pressure gauges are fitted on the flight engineer's panel they will indicate whenever battery power is available. A Haywood pneumatic compressor on the starboard inboard engine charges an air bottle to 300 pounds per square inch and is mounted just after the front turret. A pressure maintaining valve in the supply line from the pneumatic air bottle only allows pressure to be supplied to the radiator shutters superchargers and idle cutoff rams if the pressure in the air bottle exceeds 130 pounds per square inch. This is to ensure sufficient pressure for the brakes which operate at 80 pounds per square inch. It is necessary therefore to check on the triple pressure gauge mounted on the instrument panel to ensure that pressure is sufficient before the S ratio is engaged or the idle cutoff controls are operated. The vacuum pump is fitted on each inboard engine, one for operating the instruments on the instrument flying panel and the other for operating the gyros of the Mark 14 bombsight. The changeover cock is on the right of the instrument panel beside the suction gauge and in the event of failure of the vacuum pump supplying the flying instruments, the changeover cock can be used to connect the serviceable pump with the flying instruments and cut out the bomb sight. It is not possible to operate flying instruments and bomb sight on one vacuum pump. An RAE compressor fitted on the port inboard engine operates the Mark IV automatic controls and the computer unit of the Mark 14 bomb sight. For operation of the Mark 14 bomb sight, the automatic control cock must be set to out. With regard to the electrical system, a ground flight switch on the starboard side of the fuselage immediately after the front spar isolates the aircraft batteries when the aircraft is parked or when using a ground starter battery or trolleyac. Two generator switches are provided on the electrical control panel. We shall now look at the aircraft controls. The elevator, rudder and aileron trimming tab controls are located on the right of the pilot seat. All operate in the natural sense and each has an indicator. The undercarriage lever is locked in the down position by a safety bolt which has to be held aside in order to raise the lever. The bolt engages automatically when the lever is set down. The undercarriage may be lowered in an emergency by compressed air. There is no automatic lock to prevent the undercarriage being raised by mistake when the aircraft is on the ground. 
On Lancaster's 1 and 3, the undercarriage indicators show as follows. Undercarriage locked down, two green lights. Undercarriage unlocked, two red lights. Undercarriage locked up, no lights. The undercarriage indicator switch is interlocked so that it must be on when the port engine ignition switches are on. An auxiliary set of green lights can be brought into operation by pressing the central knob if failure of the main set is suspected. The red lamps are duplicated so that failure of one lamp does not affect the indication of undercarriage when unlocked. The lights can be dimmed by turning the central knob. The undercarriage warning horn sounds if either inboard throttle is closed when the undercarriage is not locked down. The outboard throttles do not operate the horn. A testing push button and lamp are behind the pilot's seat on the cockpit port rail. The flaps control push-pull handle should be moved to the neutral position after each flap movement. On Lancaster's 1 and 3, the flap indicator is switched on by a separate switch. If the flaps have been selected partly down, and it is desired to lower them fully, it may be found that the flaps will not lower further for some considerable time. This is due to the pressure in the accumulator having fallen below the pressure required to operate the flaps, but not sufficiently to cause the hydraulic pumps to cut in. To overcome this, move the flap selector to up, and then immediately put it fully down. This causes the hydraulic pumps to cut in. In an emergency, the flaps may be lowered by compressed air after lowering the undercarriage. The bomb door's control, mounted to the left of the pilot's seat, has two positions only. The bomb release system is rendered operative soon after the doors begin to open and before they are fully open. The position of the doors must therefore be checked visually before releasing bombs using the bomb bay portholes. If the bomb doors open only part way and then stop, it is probably due to icing around the hinges and joints, which raises the hydraulic pressure sufficiently to bring the cutout into operation, stopping any further movement of the doors. If the bomb door selector is moved to shut and then immediately to open, the doors will usually open further. It may be necessary to repeat this several times to get the doors to fully open. As strenuous pumping for 15 minutes is required to open the bomb doors with engines stopped, they should be opened before stopping engines if the aircraft is to be bombed up before the next flight. We shall now look at the engine controls. Climbing boost of £9 per square inch is obtained with the throttle levers at the gate. On Merlin 20 and originally on Merlin 22, 28 or 38 installations, going through the gate gives a boost of £12 per square inch at ground level only. A later modification to Merlin 22, 28 or 38 engines gives £14 per square inch boost at ground level only with the throttle levers through the gate. The boost control cutout gives £14 per square inch in M gear and £16 per square inch in S gear on Merlin's 20, 22, 28 and 38. On all Merlins, when climbing with the boost setting at less than £9 per square inch, the automatic boost control cannot open the throttle valve fully and the boost will begin to fall off before full throttle height is reached. The throttle lever should then be progressively advanced to maintain boost. On Lancaster B Mark 1s fitted with Merlin 20, 22 and 24 engines, SU carburetors are fitted. The mixture strength is automatically controlled by boost pressure and the pilot has no separate mixture control. A weak mixture is obtained below £7 per square inch of boost. That's £4 per square inch on the Merlin 20. The carburetor slow running cutouts are operated by closing the master engine cocks.
On Lancaster B Mark III and Tens, fitted with the Merlin 28 and 38 engines, Bendix Stromberg pressure injection carburetors are fitted. Again, there is no pilot's mixture control, the mixture strength being regulated by the power, so that the weak mixture is obtained below £7 per square inch and 2,650 revs per minute. The carburetor idle cutouts, which are used for starting and for stopping the engines, are operated by electro-pneumatic rams controlled by four slow-running cutout switches on the pilot's panel, just above the engine starter buttons. These switches have each two positions, the top one being the engine running position and the bottom one the idle cut-off position. In the case of electrical or pneumatic failure, the rams will return to the running position. The propeller speed control levers for the hydromatic propellers vary the governed revs per minute from 3000 down to 1800. The feathering buttons are on the right of the instrument panel. We shall cover feathering the propellers in a video covering emergencies. On early Lancaster 1 aircraft, the supercharger controls for all four engines are operated mechanically by one lever. On later Lancaster 1s and on all Lancaster 3 and 10 aircraft, the superchargers are operated by electro-pneumatic rams of the single action spring return type. In the case of electrical or pneumatic failure, the rams will return to the M ratio position. A switch fitted to the pilot's instrument panel immediately below the engine speed indicators controls all four engines simultaneously and a red warning light beside it indicates S ratio on the ground only, that is, when the undercarriage is down. The radiator shutters are automatically controlled when the switches forward of the flight engineer's panel are in the up position. When the switches are down, the thermostatic control is overridden and the shutters are opened. This position should be used for all ground running, taxiing and marshalling. Located beside the pilot's seat is the carburetor air intake heat control. A single lever for the hydraulic operation of all four carburetors hot air intakes. Hot air should not be used unless the air intakes become iced up. And as ice guards are fitted, this should really be necessary. Well that's it for this video. I hope you found it interesting. If you like what I do on this channel, please click the like button and consider subscribing and also click the bell. Remember it's free and you'll receive notifications when my future videos are posted. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.